Hi, uh, Simon Smell, gastroenterologist based in York, and welcome to More Than Just Medicine. Um, I thought I would uh, talk a little bit about the pharmacological interventions that are currently available and recognised for treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I think, first of all, I would say that these have to be taken in the context of having already addressed uh, the lifestyle issues that may contribute to irritable bowel syndrome. So uh, one has to think about diet, whether one's eating the right stuff, erratic eating, uh, the amount of fibre in the diet and all those kind of things, along with the relaxation and any other stresses that life may be uh, imposing upon uh, you or, or patients before um, you uh, kind of resort to expecting a drug to sort out you, the symptoms of uh, irritable bowel syndrome in terms of abdominal pain and change of bowel habit because uh, drugs on their own uh, often don't uh, work so if one looks at the randomized controlled trials available for drugs in the setting of irritable bowel syndrome um, the very best drugs have perhaps only a 10 or 15 percent greater uh, response rate and placebos and in any event the placebo responses in patients with irritable bowel syndrome are relatively high so perhaps up to 30 or 40 percent sometimes so about the drugs um, now uh, as a usual starting point we have uh, drugs that can be classified into what I would call broadly four categories, drugs that affect the sensitivity of the bowel, but also may affect the motility, things like peppermint oil, um, drugs that affect the motility of the bowel, and those include uh, antispasmodics, antidiarrheals, and laxatives, drugs that affect the um, nervous processing of gut sensation, particularly uh, at the dorsal horns, which is the where gut sensation goes to when it goes from the gut to the spinal cord and ends up to the brain. Um, and then uh, I think it's worth touching upon the role of prebiotics and probiotics. Uh, you know, increasingly these are recognised as, as playing a part in the diseases which we get not just in the gut. So moving back to drugs that affect a sensitivity, essentially there's a receptor in the gut uh, for peppermint, but there are also receptors for other foodstuffs such as mustard oil and peppers. And there's some evidence that those things may have a role in uh, altering uh, gut blood flow and, and motility. Um, sometimes people find them very useful. Occasionally peppermint can uh, exacerbate people's bloating and make them feel nauseous, but um, that's something to be borne in mind. But it's unlikely to do uh, significant harm, of course, uh, long-term adverse side effects. So moving on to motility agents. Um, I think uh, in people with diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome um, uh, an obvious uh, first step is to try loperamide having made sure that people don't have bile salt malabsorption and obviously that's a different condition for which sometimes a drug called cholestyramine is used. Um, but uh, loperamide simply works by slowing down the gut and allowing more time for the gut to for the large bowel to absorb the water, uh, which constitutes a significant part of the stools and often contributes to diarrhea. Um, antispasmodics often help the pain. And they're things like mebeverin, buscopan, and alvarin citrate. They can be quite useful in that context uh, at times. Um, Similarly, um, laxatives can be useful in uh, people with constipation and, and I personally would try and avoid in the long term using stimulant laxatives. So things like Senna shouldn't be used in the long term, but in the short term can sometimes be quite effective. Um, I would tend to avoid things like lactulose because lactulose often causes uh, more fermentation in the large bowel and sometimes exacerbates bloating and abdominal pain. If people have tried uh, the maximum tolerated dose of laxatives um, and aren't able to take any more or have reached the maximum dose, then it is worth considering a, a newer drug on the market called linaclotide. 
uh, and there's some evidence that, that because that works in a different way on preventing constipation, uh, it can help uh, where other laxatives have failed. And it also um, modifies uh, pain. Uh, we're not entirely clear what the mechanism of that is, but certainly the uh, studies suggest that at uh, 6 to 12 weeks there may be some modification of pain as well with that drug. Um, obviously that should be reviewed at three months um, and consideration given to whether or not it is uh, continued or discontinued. Uh, other drugs uh, that, that affect uh, irritable bowel syndrome, I touched on drugs that affect the nervous processing. Now the most commonly used and evidence-based one of those uh, are a group of drugs called tricyclics, so things like uh, lefepramine or amitriptyline, which is commonly used in um, lots of uh, pain-related conditions. Amitriptyline can cause dry mouth and constipation, so for people with loose stools it, it can have added benefits. Um, not dry mouth, obviously, but constipation. Um, it sometimes makes people sleepy, and so we advise taking it at night. And for people with functional bowel disease, it's best to take it in a relatively small dose. Usually um, 10 milligrams is often sufficient, but I wouldn't escalate the dose beyond about 30 milligrams. Uh, and very often, as I say, 10 milligrams is sufficient. Um, there are a number of other drugs that may influence processing uh, of gut sensation as it goes from the gut back into the spinal cord and then up to the brain. And we think those work at the level of the dorsal horns in the spinal cord. Um, a, a, th a drug called gabapentin and another drug called, called, called pregabalin are sometimes used, but they are uh, less well evidence-based um, in terms of randomised control trials. Um, there are also some um, other uh, drugs that people use but uh, uh, for uh, some of the nausea and sometimes epigastric discomfort. Um, but again, the evidence base for those isn't, should I say, gold standard and is often anecdotal. If tricyclics haven't worked and people have tried the range of other drugs available, then um, SSRIs, so things like citalopram and fluoxetine, are sometimes used. Although again, the evidence for those is, is less good in terms of the standards of evidence, although clearly there's reasonable anecdotal evidence that they may have benefits in some people. But as I've said before, the placebo effect in irritable bowel syndrome is considerable and uh, uh, the benefits of any specific drug are often uh, only on a small group of patients within the cohort of people who have irritable bowel syndrome. Um, aside from the drugs that affect sensitivity, motility, and the nervous processing of gut sensation. I touched on uh, probiotics and prebiotics. Now, it shouldn't come as a great surprise that the billions and billions of bugs that live in our guts have an influence on the diseases that we get. And increasingly, we believe not just the gut diseases, but also uh, the psychiatric illnesses and the other autoimmune and, and malignant diseases that we may get over a lifetime are also influenced by the guts that live in our, by the bugs that live in our guts. Um, I will uh, do another uh, video in the near future about the uh, potential effects of probiotics on on prebiotics on irritable bowel. Although again, uh, absolute evidence in an individual is. Uh, well, the effect in, a, in an individual is difficult to predict. Um, what is clear is that sometimes they do help, but they may exacerbate bloating and abdominal discomfort at times. Thanks for listening. Speak again soon.